Neighbors in a homeowners association have issues that I don't follow the HOA rules, alternate chaos 5150 post, so the neighbors called me a butt today. I bought a house five years ago that a real estate company built on speculation. Mine was the first house in a planned subdivision that they were going to build one house at a time or as people bought the individual tracts of land. The area kind of hit a boom period and the other surrounding houses went up quick. In my contract to purchase my home, there was no homeowners association and because I was here first, I don't have to join any if the other neighbors decide to create. I'm grandfathered in is what it says in my contract. They all seem to forget this though, and they continually try to give me HOA fines for breaking the rules of the HOA. This has ranged from days that I have things delivered to my home, like Amazon deliveries on Sundays, to when I cut my grass, to me having vehicles parked in my yard and they aren't happy that I own an extra tract of land because I bought two to have a bigger yard so that I could build a shooting range. I live in the south, this is not that uncommon. The recent event though that led them to call me a butt is that they came over to ask me to remove the eyesore in front of my garage. Now, my home faces the road, not anyone else's house, so they don't stare at my garage, but apparently they still don't like it. I run a small hobby business of doing woodworking projects and I have a shelf outside my garage door full of various pieces of treated lumber that I may use one day. It's not the neatest and the cleanest area, but it's not a disheveled mess either. So I told them if they lightened up and just left me alone about all the other stuff, I'd consider moving my wood pile if it bothered them so much. They proceeded to tell me that I needed to address all the HOA issues and take care of the wood pile, along with stopping any deliveries on Sundays and getting my other truck out of my yard. They handed me what basically amounts to a ticket and I trashed it and I told them to get the heck off my property. They called me a butt for my unreasonable behavior and told me they'd be back. I've been in contact with a real estate attorney about the deed and whether or not they can still attempt to legally force anything. Also, I've contacted one on creating a cease and desist. I do have cameras on my property. The vehicle in the yard is just one and it's not an abandoned wreck, it's a fairly new truck that I use mostly on weekends. It sets there so I can get my other vehicles out easier. I do move it when I mow, so it's just sitting there beside my driveway. Do you agree with this comment? Not the butt. Is there any way to get a sort of restraining order on the HOA? Not the people per se, the entity itself. Or a cease and desist maybe? I don't know, but I'd totally do that if I were me. Yeah, I mean, if you're not in it and you're grandfathered in, that's what your legal contract says. HOA story time. Everything the association does causes damages. Posted by Busticode. Just a vent, but this stuff is getting old. Single family home, about 50 units. Seems this association finds the most incompetent vendors and unleashes them on the residents. First off, they hired a power washing company to clean siding. They left everyone's windows spotted and the overspray affected car finishes. Most homes are two stories and we can't clean our windows. They even hired an irrigation company to repair broken underground feeder pipes. They cut my underground cable TV and internet cable when digging up the yard. And now, a landscaping company is ripping out all the plants and rocks around every home, doing a halfway butt job and just found out that one of the workers deliberately cut a cable on my property going into my house. Found out the total cost of that project was over 250 grand. Several of us have mice problems. The HOA document states that the HOA is 100% responsible and owns all outside walls. I asked the HOA to remedy our mice problems and nope, not their responsibility. Well, how else are the mice getting in if not through their walls? So we asked the management company to follow bylaws and post date, time, and place of each meeting in accordance with the bylaws. <laughs> no. We even asked the management company to post the minutes of past monthly meetings in accordance with the bylaws, blown off and never posted. We sent in the request for approval to replace a sliding door, we have a sign off form for that, and after much chatter among the HOA board, I get an email saying only approved. The door company refused to accept that and said that we won't install the door until they see that the request was signed off officially. In a few days, we're going to have our dryer vents blown out, but really in as they're doing it from the outside. No opt out, so I guess I'll just have lint blown into my dryer. 
My neighbor has had to purchase asphalt on his own and repair a huge pothole on HOA owned road as the management company did nothing about it for three, three whole years. I'm just, I'm just really beginning to hate it here and dealing with all these stupid issues. I once was helpful around here fixing children's playground equipment for free, doing small jobs for the association so they didn't need to pay huge fees for tiny projects. <laughs> no more of that. Do you agree with this idea to get some lawyers? Not posting meetings, agendas, or minutes are probably just a violation of law, not just bylaws depending on your state. Throwing a couple hundred dollars at a lawyer to write a letter informing them of the laws that are breaking might convince them to get their act together, or at least leave the job to someone who will. The lawyer can mention the other issues where the HOA is breaching their duty as well. It's somewhat counterproductive to sue your HOA since you'll end up paying whether you win or lose, but the threat of a lawsuit can be effective. How would you handle this one? Karen declares war on my parents for cutting a tree down on their own property. Posted by EAY 7712. I, a 25 male, have been living away from home ever since graduating from college. My parents both retired recently, and last summer, they decided to use some of the money that they'd saved up to finally build their dream retirement home in New Orleans, where they've been living for the past 10 years. I come from a very tight-knit family, so I still talk to my parents every week, and they were so excited when they said they'd already picked out the location where they wanted the house built. It was an empty lot in a nice neighborhood, where a house had been demolished not long before due to age and the previous owner, who was pretty wealthy and owned numerous properties around the city, had decided that the lot was worth more without the house on it. Anyway, my parents snapped it up as soon as it came on the market, but not long after construction began, they realized that they were building their dream house right next door to the lair of a wild Karen. The trouble started when my parents had to cut down a large oak tree that sat in front of the lot. It was a real beauty too, one of those big southern live oaks and although they didn't want to, they knew they had to remove it because it was in the way. No one likes to cut down a big beautiful tree and believe me, if there was a way to avoid doing it without impeding the construction, my parents would have taken it. So they called a tree removal service and the tree was soon gone. Well, a few days after the tree had been cut down, my dad was on the property talking to some of the construction guys and making sure that everything was going smoothly. He was going back to his car when he saw a woman in her late 50s walk out of the house next door and head to the mailbox. My dad, let's call him John, is a pretty chill and laid back guy who likes to be on good terms with everyone, so he walked over and introduced himself. Hi, he said, holding out his hand. My name's John, and my wife and I are going to be your neighbors once our house is finished. I just wanted to come over and say hi and introduce myself. It's nice to meet you. What's your name? Karen glanced at the extended hand and then looked up at my dad and glared at him. My name is none of your business, she snapped. I'm not going to shake your hand because of COVID, and even if there uh, was no COVID, I still wouldn't shake your hand because you people ruined my life when you cut down my tree. I still can't believe how selfish you are. You should both be ashamed of yourselves. My dad was taken aback by this and pointed out that Karen already had a nice big oak tree in her backyard, but Karen ignored him and stalked back inside her house. She never explained why she thought that she was the owner of that tree that had been cut down, not once, and whenever my parents asked about it, she refused to answer. I guess it's just one of those things that we'll never know, like what really happened to the lost Roanoke colony or the fate of D.B. Cooper. My parents met some of their other neighbors later that day, including a nice elderly couple who lived in the other house next door to Karen's, and when my dad told them what had happened, the neighbors said that Karen was like that to everyone, and no one in the neighborhood liked her. They also said that Karen had been nasty to them for a long time, and that they were in the process of selling their house because they couldn't stand living next door to her anymore. Karen soon began living up to her reputation. For months, whenever my parents would visit the house to see how the construction was coming along, she'd find something to complain about or confront them about. One time, she said that construction workers were being too loud and threatened to call the police, even though it was the middle of the day. Another time, she said that the construction company was using illegal immigrants as cheap labor and threatened to call ICE and have the whole project shut down. 
My dad mentioned this to the owner of the company, and the owner sent Karen a formal letter threatening a lawsuit if she tried. I don't know if there were any actual grounds for a lawsuit, but the threat must have worked because ICE never showed up. Oh, and then there was a the time that she tried to have my parents' car towed for illegal parking when they parked by the curb of their still unfinished house. The first my parents knew about this was when the tow truck showed up, but the driver took one look at where my parents' car was parked and told Karen that he'd send her a bill for wasting his time if she called him again. I could go on. I mean, Karen did everything she could think of to try and interfere. She was absolutely relentless in her crusade to avenge a tree that she never even owned. Happily, the house was completed despite her best efforts and my parents finally moved in not long after the holidays. My mom told me later that she caught Karen watching them bitterly from her window as they were taking some of their boxes inside. She was concerned that Karen might keep going and try something else, but I guess Karen was too busy wallowing in self-pity over her failure or something because things were actually quiet for a while. But a few weeks ago, things changed. New Orleans has had some really bad weather lately due to the winter storms that are battering much of the southern US right now. And one night, one of those storms was so powerful that it knocked over the tree in Karen's backyard. It missed falling onto her house, but it didn't miss falling onto her shiny new Jaguar and crushing it like a beer can. According to my folks, Karen didn't discover what happened until the following morning. When she came outside and saw the pile of scrap metal that used to be her car, she threw back her head and let out a primal scream like something out of The Exorcist. She had to pay a tree removal service to get rid of the tree, and then she had to pay for a tow truck to get rid of the car too. And then she had to get a rental car too. Karen put up her property for sale and moved out not long afterward. Everyone in the neighborhood was so glad to see her go, and my parents enjoyed watching her drive off into the sunset from the front porch of their amazing new house. Now, Karen did not sell her house right away. She put it on the market and moved out of it as soon as she could. I don't know where she is now, but I'm guessing that she's staying somewhere else while she waits for someone to buy the property. I don't know if anyone's bought it yet, but since there's a pandemic going on, <laughs> I think she'll be waiting for some time. Karen yells at the security guard for doing her job, posted by Daddy Dorian Art. Ah, oh, my mother is well known to be a Karen, even joking about it herself sometimes. She's usually really sweet, but when it comes to staff or workers, her Karen side comes out full force. I have many stories about her antics. So she is labeled here as a Karen, since she wears the name proudly. Me and my partner are moving out of our house to a new town. So last week, I moved back home with my parents for a few days to clean out my old storage room while my partner went down to the new town for his first day of school. My dad had a seizure the first day that I moved home. So my mom, Karen, asked me to help her with some general shopping while my grandmother watched my four siblings and took care of my dad. I drove us around town and to a few stores, eventually ending up at a Kmart. Think Walmart for us Kiwis, but no food, only general items. She wanted to get some workout gear, so we go in, we do our shopping, and we head to the checkouts. Here's where things get going. She grabbed the receipt and I grabbed the items, getting ready to walk out of the store. There had been lots of thefts recently due to the economic climate of my country at the moment. So security will quickly glance at your receipt, see the number of items that you have and let you out. Usually they don't do this to everyone, just shady people, which has gotten the company in hot water because of racism and discrimination. So the company now makes it an effort to check all receipts, which I'm fine with. As we walk out, my mother makes it past the security scanners before the young lady working as a security guard asks to see the receipt. Big mistake. My mother immediately screws her face up and makes more than a few scoffing sounds before exclaiming loudly, excuse me, do I look like someone who would shoplift? At this point, everyone at the Teals is looking over, and I feel like melting into a puddle to get away as I have social anxiety. 
the poor lady puts her hands up in an, oh no, Karen on the loose gesture and politely explains that we need to check everyone's receipts so we aren't discriminating. Mother Karen puffs up and screws her face up more. But do I look like a shoplifter? All my clothes are labeled, all expensive brands. She then scoffs again, winding up for a whole tirade, waving the little paper that would save me from embarrassment all around, all while flapping her lips like a shocked fish. She is slowly turning into a lovely shade of tomato red and looks like she's going to burst. Realizing things are going to get much, much worse, I finally pick myself up out of my mental puddle, grab the receipt from her claws, and show the security guard who's still attempting to placate the raging she-beast. I hand it over politely saying, here, have a look, is this okay? While gazing longingly at those sliding doors, as I know, salvation from the dirty looks hitting the back of my head is only a few steps away. The poor security guard waves me through, and I grab my mother beast's shoulder to push her out. She relents, moving through and muttering about rights and managers, and not doing her job, stamping her feet like a toddler. I look over my shoulder as we walk out and give the security lady, who looked like she had just been slapped, a little smile and mouthed apology. The last words I hear before the doors to salvation slid shut was the security guard commenting in a small voice, I only needed to see the receipt. It's my job. I felt horrified. Relief flooded me as I realized that it was over. Embarrassment burning at my cheeks as I shepherded the Karen to the car. All while she's still going on about how outrageous this was and how she feels disgusting and like a vagrant, all because she was asked to show her receipt. Thinking this was over, I hopped in the front seat, hands shaking and eyes tearing up. But no, the Karen turns to me, scrunched up her face, and made one more remark. This only happened because you look homeless. Wear a dress next time. Oh, thanks, Mom. Thanks. Military Revenge Story, posted by Von Scranhammer. This was back in 2013 when I was based in Holland, the British Marine, for context. I had been married to my wife for a little over 18 months when I deployed to Afghanistan. My wife had gotten a job in the British delegation on base and got to know pretty much every Brit and their husband and wife. One day, we were directly targeted by a vehicle-borne IED. Now, while it wasn't uncommon for there to be a threat to coalition forces in general, being directly targeted felt more personal for obvious reasons. That was also the day I found out about an RAF guy back in Holland had tried it on with my wife. I found him on Facebook and, still feeling rather raw about Terry trying to blow me up, I messaged him words to the effect of, if you go near Mrs. Von Scranhammer again, I will put glass in your throat the next time I see you. The next day, one of my bosses, who was also RAF, messaged me on Facebook to say that this guy had been over to his office and basically tattled on me. He gave me a friendly warning and heads up that this guy could have gone to the MPs, military police, and reported me. I have no idea what would have happened, but I acknowledged the warning and said it won't happen again. My boss had my back and actually told him to wind his neck. Fast forward to when I got back from Afghan. A few days had passed and I was starting to settle into a quote normal life again. My wife brought it up after explaining that she didn't mention it at the time due to my reaction the first time that an army sergeant major had tried to message her via Facebook. He told her that she was beautiful and wanted her number. She promptly blocked him. I was ticked off to say the least, but I understand why she kept it until I was back on home soil. The next day, I went into our department and spoke to my other boss, an army captain, and I told him what had happened and he said, leave it with me. He basically had a chat with him and nothing came of it. I felt deflated and even more ticked off. That was until our senior military officer came into our department. He welcomed me back and asked how my tour was. Still ticked off, I said, well, it was good, sir, with the exception of Sergeant Major D-Bag trying to get round my wife. 
he was understandably a little taken aback. About an hour or so later, he emailed me saying that he feels the need to do something official about this. Something I had forgotten was that the colonel and sergeant major belonged to the same regiment, so having one of his own behave like this had clearly gripped him. I told him the full story and provided screenshots of what Sergeant Major Debag had said to Miss Von Scranhammer. For this to go official, my wife had to provide a statement. Unfortunately, Miss Von Scranhammer is very non-confrontational and said that she didn't want this to continue. I respected her wishes of not wanting to provide a statement, but hatched a plan that would be three years in the making. The timing is important. I emailed the colonel and said that Miss Von Scranhammer has declined. However, I felt the need for some formal recognition, so I asked that Sergeant Major Debag write a letter of an apology addressed to both my wife and I, which is to be signed and dated. This was granted and I received the letter two days later. It said, Lance Corporal and Miss Von Scranhammer, I am writing this letter to you both to apologize for the torment and the anxiety that you both must have felt from my messages that you'd received from my Facebook account. To Mrs. Von Scranhammer, nobody should ever be in a situation where they worry about going to work because of who may come through the door, especially so when they have the added stress of a partner being operationally deployed at the time. The anguish that you must have felt at this time is immeasurable, and for this, I apologize. To Lance Corporal Von Scranhammer, being operationally deployed is stressful enough without the added stress and worry about family back home. Support from home and loved ones is what carries many people through tough times while on tour. For any undue angst I caused, I apologize. I regret any hurt and anguish caused by this issue and apologize wholeheartedly and unreservedly to you both. Signed, Sergeant Major Debag. I now waited. I saw out the rest of my time in Holland, moved back to the UK to my new base, and waited some more. Almost three years after I received the apology letter, I looked up Sergeant Major Debag's wife on Facebook. I had known the whole time we were out there that he was married and his wife lived back in the UK, and he has routinely tried to cheat on her. I sent her the same screenshot which I had sent to the colonel. I also, before leaving Holland, printed off the emails between the colonel and myself where I requested the apology letter, I blanked out the colonel's details, and sent the pictures of that. And then, lastly, I sent a picture of the apology letter, signed and dated by her husband admitting what he had done. Once I saw she had read it, I blocked her, blocked Sergeant Major Debag and all his friends who had also been out in Holland at the same time. Why three years? I remember him saying, before he turned into a D-bag and tried it on with my wife, that he only had three years left to serve. If my timing was correct, he was months away for completing his 22 years and receiving a very nice pension. If his wife decided to go ahead with divorce, she would take half of said pension, which would essentially screw him over for the rest of his life. Ooh, man, that was nasty. It started off kind of chill, like, okay, he's going to get some decent pro revenge, and then by the end, he just drops the freaking hammer. Oh my goodness, I am taken aback and surprised by this resolution. Are you? It's literally insane. Force me to deploy, I'll destroy your career, posted by Sheba Was Talking. Let's go back a few years. I was a combat engineer platoon sergeant. We had recently gotten a new company commander who thought his crap didn't stink. My first interaction with him was when I got back from running at M240B range where I was told that he wanted to speak to all leadership immediately in the conference room. Well, it took three hours for him to arrive and despite first sergeant calling many times, he insisted we stay. The entire meeting was him bragging about himself and saying that he was trying to get the company slotted for a deployment to the Middle East, as well as how excited he was to go. I spoke up and basically said he's a dummy, but with more words, which ended the meeting and got me a stern talking to in thinly veiled threats. This captain had been in for 15 years and never once been deployed. That takes effort and a lot of figurative sucking up. He only wanted to go now because he was up for major. It turned out Brigade had a mission and asked for volunteers. Captain Dummy volunteered me to go despite knowing I had gotten married a week earlier. 
I made it very clear that I did not want to go to the higher ups. I was told it was between myself and the captain. Well, a month out, my sister-in-law took herself from this world immediately after she miscarried at 33 weeks, found them both in the basement of their house. Well, Captain Dummy didn't care. No leave, and I was still to leave about a week after the funeral. Screw him. I walked in to talk to the command sergeant major and was immediately dropped from the deployment. But the captain was so far up the battalion commander's butt that nothing happened to him. After about eight months later, Captain Dummy got his wish. Headquarters platoon and one other was slotted to deploy. Of course, because I had the most combat experience and most deployments in the platoon, he naturally decided that's why my platoon should go. Now, in order to deploy, you first have to go to a month-long field exercise where you're graded on performance. This generally applies to the higher levels of leadership. By this time, I was just ticked. So, I got my squad leaders together and improvised a few missions. First, everyone was to follow the CPT's instructions as literally as possible, the captain, no matter how dumb, and not to give any advice. This led us to getting absolutely destroyed in training, which was glorious. Secondly, and most importantly, was the psychological aspect. So, this dummy commander would go to bed nightly at 2100 hours, no matter what. In the deserts of California, you can find all sorts of creepy crawlies to slip in a sleeping bag while sprinkling juice on his uniform. They'd also periodically hide some of his gear or render his rifle inoperable. So for days this went on, poor guy slept very little because I ensured his tent was set over top of a beehive. These bees hated any vibration and loved juice, and the dummy never realized why he was constantly getting stung. As we were to be falling under a new brigade, I had to go meet the higher ups, and wouldn't you know it, the colonel we were set to fall under, turned out, had been my first company commander who I got along great with. I pulled him aside and called up my squad leaders where we basically told him Captain Dummy was going to get somebody killed, pointed out his erratic behavior and overall poor performance. Needless to say, he was quickly relieved of command, a career killer, and sent back to work in an office where he belonged. As for myself and my platoon, I still didn't want to go, but the new company commander was my old platoon leader for my second deployment, plus I couldn't let my guys go without me. Turned out, it would be my last deployment as some injuries force you out of the military, but everyone came back alive. Now what can make this pro revenge even crazier other than completely dismantling this guy's career? What if he'd been allergic to bees? Seriously, like you have him over top of a beehive, they love the juice, they're just going bzz, 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 and just stinging him to death, and, and he's allergic to him, maybe. I don't know. If he was, that would be a clear, that'd be a nuclear explosive revenge. But OP, you did what you wanted to do, it was brutal, and you got the job done, even though you still ended up having to go. What do you think? Crappy bosses mess around and find out. Posted by Onaplanth. I had a job working warehouse and delivery for a store. The entire corporate structure was built on treating the people below you like crap, and that was passed down through every level. Managers would just bark orders and chew you out for any reason they could think of. They paid about 25 cents over minimum wage, and the bosses drove BMWs and Mercedes. The big boss lived in an $8 million house. Our store was the freight hub for four others in this little chain, so we got to know the drivers from the other stores well, as they were always coming to load freight or to drop stuff off. One day, we're sitting with two drivers from another store, and Buddy remarks that he and his partner are working over 60 hours a week. I say, well, he must be doing okay with all that overtime pay. He says they're not getting overtime, just paid a straight time rate. I ask him if he signed an averaging agreement, and he says no. He shows me his pay stub, and there it is. His partner comes back and confirms all this, and they've been doing it for months. He'd ask his manager about overtime and been told that straight pay was just the way it worked. I tell them that's illegal and urge them to take it to the labor relations. They're both reluctant to rock the boat, figuring they'll be fired. So I drop it. We, we never got any overtime. Our warehouse was busy, but our store wasn't. A couple months later, they're in again and Buddy's partner tells us that he and his girlfriend are moving back east and he's giving his notice. I tell him again to file a complaint, nothing to lose now, so he does. 
A few weeks go by, and when I come in one day, there are expensive boss cars parked all along the loading dock. My workmate says something big is going down. All the managers have been summoned and are inside with a bunch of people in suits. So we wander upstairs to see what's going on. The company bookkeeper had an office in our store and handled all the payroll. He was a Chinese immigrant, nice guy. The bosses were trying to pin this on him, saying he didn't speak English very well, which was true, and had obviously screwed everything up. Turns out, he was a pretty cagey guy. He knew what they told him to do was illegal and was able to produce all the records of him telling them that and of them telling him to basically just shut up and do it. He hands it all over and quits. I see Buddy with a new partner a few weeks later. He's got a pay stub for about 15 paychecks worth of earnings. Company got caught for all the overtime pay and a pretty substantial fine on top of that. Added bonus, the second in command had driven over a nail when he parked his silver BMW on the loading dock and had a flat when he came out of the store. He opened his trunk and called me over and said, change that for me. I told him, sorry, it's not my job and if I hurt myself, my compensation claim would be denied. As he went in to call a tow truck, I stood on the loading dock and gazed upon all the havoc I had wrought and my heart was glad. The thing you gotta love about this is they're literally doing something illegal by not paying the working class people who need that money, who work their hardest every single day, and screwing them over all while they are being rich and having all the fun in the world, illegally. Way to go, OP. Woman steals nearly $100 worth of stuff less than one foot from my face and gets mad when I call her out, posted by Dito. Hello everyone, this happened a few days ago at the smoke shop that I work at. I'm also an assistant manager there for context. I'm in the back office prepping a return when my manager points my attention to an obviously suspicious person in our store. She was wearing a coat three sizes too big, bright red, and it was not even that cold outside. I turn around and she's crouched down behind the back room door looking at the vape clearance rack. The back room door is one of those swing doors and not a real one, so I just watched her as she did this, oblivious to my presence. When she walks away from the rack, I go to the counter. I see her take a value pack of vapes that we had left over for Christmas and walks to the other side of the store with it. We never saw that again. Then she walks back to the register, presses her body against an end cap and is very loudly opening one of the vapes. It came in this plastic wrap around it so it was extremely loud and she's less than a foot from my face and I'm making eye contact basically with her as she does this. She walks back and forth a bit and while she's walking around all of the vapes are in full view in her giant coat pockets. I'm texting my manager who's in the office watching the cameras about everything. She finally comes to the register again to purchase a $2 CBD gummy when I call her out about the vapes in her pocket and if she intends to buy those too. She starts acting innocent until my manager comes out and notices them too and is questioning her about it. She tried to say that she bought them the day before to which my boss says, okay, great, we can check the inventory then to see if they were purchased. She starts getting defensive about it and screaming at my boss as we prove to her there is no way she bought those and all three of us, another coworker being the third, saw her doing this in plain sight. She starts to walk away and we call the police as we cannot physically restrain or keep people there and we get the license plate of the car and tell the operators that. <laughs> well, they caught her. The dummy also had her friend drive there and they were too oblivious to what his friend did when the cops called him. They tracked his license plate. I don't know what happened after that, but we are almost positive she went to jail or is going to because my manager requested to press charges. Oh, Karen, now you might not realize this, but stores, whenever you steal things from them, they wait until it's up to like a felony level before getting you, so you think you make it away, but you actually don't. In this case, they got Karen, and they got her good. No ifs, ands, or cigarette butts about it. How dare you not help me when you're not on the clock? Posted by Bears and Butts. This happened Saturday afternoon, busiest day of the week. After taking my 30 minute lunch break, I came back inside the building, went up to the back room to drop off my bag, and then back to the register to clock back in and resume my shift. I'm not wearing a name tag or a walkie talkie, and our store's uniform is a red, blue, or green t-shirt and dark jeans. So while I am wearing the uniform, I wouldn't say it's easily identifiable. However, 
I must still be official looking because on my way back to the register, a woman asked if I work there. And being honest, I told her yes. However, I wasn't on the clock yet and I could help her with whatever she needed as soon as I clocked in. She muttered something under her breath, but did follow me to the register where two of my coworkers were who were actually on the clock. The register was being used, so it took me a second longer before I was able to clock in. Meanwhile, the woman spoke to my other coworker, who happened to be one of the managers, and just wanted to, quote, let her know how I refused to answer her question until I was on the clock. Love that customers now expect me to do my job, customer service, helping them find things in the store or answer any of their questions for free. Especially since that there were at least four other employees in the store who were all on the clock and available to help her. Maybe you like to do your work without being compensated for it, but I'm not going to lead you around the store without getting paid for it first. I mean, Karen, come on, it's basic math. On the clock pay, help, not on the clock, don't pay, don't help. But you probably don't get that now, do ya? The HOA demands that we follow their rules, but we aren't even in the HOA. Click the video on your screen so you don't miss the fallout of this one, and I'll see you there.